again tonight, and glad that uh, you are here. And um, again, I'm, I got a thin crowd. I must have gone too long or run them off, and TJ is going to have to mop up my problems tonight. So uh, I'm glad you're here. Uh, let's go ahead and uh, just make a mental note of our first quarter business meeting is going to switch from April the 7th to the 14th. Let's go ahead and stand and turn to page 322. It'll be up on your screen. Uh, stand up, stand up for Jesus. And you may not sit down while you sing this song. It's Baptist law, I think. Trust and obey, and after the first verse, we'll take time to greet those about you. Sweet, we will sit at his feet 
or we'll walk by his side in the way. What he says we will do, where he sends we will go, never fear, only trust and obey. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus, but to trust and obey. Amen. <laughs> Death was arrested. Death was arrested. Amen. Alone in my sorrow and dead in my sin Lost without hope with no place to begin Your love made a way to let mercy come in When death was arrested and my life began Ash was redeemed, only beauty remains My orphan heart was given a name my morning grew quiet, my feet rose to dance When death was arrested and my life began Oh, your grace so sweet washes over me You have made me new, now life begins with you It's your My chains, I'm a prisoner no more. My shame was a ransom he faithfully bore. He canceled my debt and he called me his friend. When death was arrested and my life began. Oh, your grace so free washes over me. You have made rest on that last one. These songs are so high, if I don't go very, very loud, you won't hear me. So that's the only way I can get those notes. And uh, let's just praise the Lord tonight. Amen. Amen. Uh, exalted overall. Man, if this one don't get you, I don't know what will. We've got a God that reigns over everything and everyone. It's because He created all things. Amen. 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 <clears throat> Thank 
from heaven's throne you came to us and set your heart upon the cross we'll never know the sacrifice you made for all our sins and all our shame you took the nails and took our place no one else could do what you have done. One name is higher, one name is stronger than any grave, than any throne. Christ exalted over all. From the grave where death would die, you rose again and brought us life. You're reigning now, the Savior of the world. You're reigning now, the Savior of the world. One name is higher, one name is stronger than any Messiah, to you alone our praise belongs, Christ exalted over all. We sing your praise, we sing your praise, we sing your praise forever. We lift your name, we lift your name, Jesus over all. One name is stronger than any grave, than any throne. Christ exalted over all, the only Savior, Jesus Messiah. To you alone a praise belongs, Christ exalted over all. Our praise belongs, Christ exalted over all. Amen. You may be seated. All right, we're going to have a special uh, by TJ and Michaela. The blood of Jesus speaks for me. Be still, my soul, redeeming love. Out of the dust of Calvary is rising to the throne above. There is no vengeance in his cry. While it is finished, fills the sky. Forgiveness is the final plea. The blood of Jesus speaks for me. My heart can barely take it in. He pardons all my guilty stains. Surrender all my shame to Him. He breaks the curse of every chain. My sin is great, but greater still. The boundless grace His heart reveals A mercy deeper than the sea The blood of Jesus speaks for me When my accuser makes the claim That I should die for my offense I point him to that rugged frame where I found life at Christ's expense. See from his hands, his feet is high. 
The fountain flowing deep and wide Oh, hear it shout the victory The blood of Jesus speaks for me Worthy is the Lamb, Lamb for sinners slain Jesus, Lord of all, glory to His name Heaven crying out, let the earth proclaim Power in the blood Glory to his name, Jesus. Oh, let my soul arise and sing. My confidence is not in vain. The one who fights for me is king. His oath is covered, never made. No condemnation now or dread. Eternal hope is mine instead. His word will stand, I stand redeemed. The blood of Jesus speaks for me. Amazing love, how can it be? The blood of Jesus speaks for me. Sweet. No big deal. Yeah, no big deal. Good night. Man, we spent all that time getting my... Spent all this time making sure the wire was where I wanted it. Wrong one. It's all good. All right, are we ready for some preaching or what? I was so bummed to not preach last week. But as I was laying there, well, as I was laying there trying not to die, all I could think about was I just whined through the whole thing. Uh... All my prayers were whiny prayers. And then after, when I was functioning again, I was like, man, that was 24 hours of complete discomfort, no rest whatsoever, no sleep, no anything. And then, because I was in my right mind, I'm like, man, how terrible will hell be? Because no rest for eternity? Come on. So then I had to take my sorry butt and thank the Lord for saving me and for, ask for forgiveness for whining for 72 hours straight. But anyway, I'm glad to be back. Thank you guys for the prayers. Um, open your Bibles to Matthew 8. So today I'm going to break uh, I'm going to break my typical mold. We are not going to do the uh, historical, devotional, doctrinal tonight. I'm going to be a total hypocrite, and we're going to do this. We're going to do this thing like they do 
and all the other churches. We're just going to go straight devotional application today. Um, so yeah, I, I wrote this sermon. I wrote this sermon with other people in mind, I guess. So I'm going to try to have, I'm going to try to scale it back. Like I'm writing and I'm like, why am I angry? Like, <laughs> who am I yelling at? But then you guys are my good crowd. You guys are the ones, uh, seriously, this, this is the stuff that you guys will do. So therefore, I'm like, I have to preach it. So <clears throat> hopefully it'll be good tonight. Uh, with that, uh, open with me in a word of prayer. <clears throat> Father, thank you, Lord, for this day, and thank you for um, the privilege to preach, God. I'm finding more and more that I just love doing it. There's not anything I'd rather do. There's nothing that makes me happier. So Lord, thank you for the privilege to speak your word, God. You, uh, you've exalted your word above all your name. God, I pray that I would do uh, justice to your word tonight, and that you would be glorified through uh, this sermon. Lord, I just pray that this would, uh, Lord, challenge somebody in here um, to actually apply this and, and get things right with you, Lord, that they need to get right um, for your glory. Be with my mind and my speech, Lord, and with your people. Pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. <clears throat> All right. Can I borrow your phone, Mikhail? I need a timer. We're going to be here forever. All right, so we're going to be in Matthew 8, uh, verse 18. So I was going to try to squeeze 18 through 34 all in one sermon, but then I, I bailed on that idea. Um, so we're just going to get through 22 today. So pick up with me in verse 18. Now, when Jesus saw great multitudes about him, he gave commandment to depart unto the other side. And a certain scribe came and said unto him, Master, I will follow thee whithersoever thou goest. And Jesus saith unto him, the foxes have holes, and the birds of the air have nests. But the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. And another of his disciples said unto him, Lord, suffer me first to go and bury my father. But Jesus said unto him, Follow me, and let the dead bury their dead. So, I don't know about you guys, but when I read this, I'm like, a couple different times in this text, I'm like, ouch. I'm like, didn't Jesus like want these guys to follow him? Like, as I'm writing this, I'm like, he's horrible. Jesus is terrible at marketing. Like he doesn't do, he doesn't do the church game like we do the church game now. Like Jesus didn't have a big billboard, you know, saying, "Come see me. You're gonna feel so great afterwards when you're done." Uh, just look at look at what he does. So verse 18, great multitudes come to him. What's he do? He leaves. He's like, "I'm out of here. I, don't, I just." All these people, man, I, I'm, I need to go catch a break. I, I need to get out of here. And then a guy comes up to him and says, Master, I, I will follow you wherever you're going to go. And then Jesus says, well, the housing's going to be really terrible, and I have no benefits to offer you, and, uh, you know, you may not know where you're going to lay your head, and yada, yada. That's just... If the roles were switched, that certainly wouldn't be my claim. I, I'd be trying to keep that on the back end, and then once they already signed, then I'd be like, oh yeah, by the way, uh, no housing. Like, And then a guy comes to him and says, man, if you just let me bury my father, then I'll, I will follow you. And then Jesus says, uh, actually, uh, don't bury your dad. Leave that, just that doesn't matter, and come follow me. Like, if you're trying to draw a crowd and if you're trying to get a following, that's certainly not how you do it. So you've got to wonder in the back of your mind, what is Jesus doing? Why is he approaching these people this way? Like, why hit them square in the mouth with something like that? It's almost like, he was trying to get them to not follow him. Almost like he's trying to weed people out. What we find throughout the Gospels over and over is that Jesus wasn't in the market of just gathering. He wasn't trying to build the biggest crowd. And he wasn't just trying to gather supporters who were like, oh, I like that guy. No, oh yeah, Jesus. I, I, I like Jesus. No, what you see over and over is that Jesus is in the business He's in the business of multiplying disciples. What Jesus is looking for is the people who say, man, it, does, it doesn't matter what it costs. 
I'm in for it. I'm going to do it. So he weeds them out by letting them know up front, hey, there is a cost to this thing. This whole following me thing, this whole being a disciple thing, yeah, that's not free. That's going to cost you dearly. And he lets people know up front. So I think this is a good time to make a distinction because this is the first time that we see anything like this popping up in the Gospels. Um, We need to make a distinction between somebody who believes on Jesus and somebody who is a follower of Jesus. I've heard, I mean, in my little, you know, church circles that I've grown up in and yada, yada, I used to hear pastors say, man, I I try to preach people out of getting saved. I try to tell them, oh, it's going to be hard and you're going to have to sacrifice all this stuff in your life. And well, what are they doing? They're taking two different things which is salvation, which is by grace through faith, and they're taking discipleship and growth in the Lord, which is marked by obedience and sacrifice. And they're blending them and they're making them one thing when they're actually two things. You don't preach people out of getting saved. Are you kidding me? Like, you, if any reason's a good reason to get saved, it doesn't matter what it is. But then once somebody is saved... Then you got to sit them down and say, hey man, uh, I'm so pumped that you're saved and I love that for you. But do you know that there is more to your Christian life than just a once in a lifetime decision that you made and this, this prayer of faith that you prayed, like there is more to your life than that. That your life is supposed to be something. It's supposed to become something. There's a life of following Jesus Christ and, and submitting to his commandments and becoming more and more like him as you grow in the Lord and doing the work of the Lord, that that's its own thing. That is discipleship. And if we can't make a distinction between someone being just saved and someone who actually, it's almost like they cross a line in their heart where they say, I'm going to follow Christ. What he says, I will do. Where he sends, I will go. Trust and obey. That, that is a discipleship song. That's not a salvation song. But there is a difference, and we have got to start being mindful of that. Just because you're saved doesn't mean you're done. Like, I was just talking to Eli about this last night. For, for a lot of people, it's what the Bible says and the commandments that are in God's word, they only matter to disciples, like, in reality. If you're just saved, and that's just it, doesn't, who cares what the Bible says? You're not going to do it anyways. None of it, you're just going to disobey it or whatever. Obedience and following the Lord and keeping his commandments, that applies to a specific group of people who have made a decision and they say, I will follow the Lord. In my life, I'm going to, I am going to establish in my life a pattern of obedience. That's what I'm going to do. So those are different. And what we see in this context is that Jesus is making that really clear. There is a cost to discipleship. Salvation free. You get it by grace through faith. Jesus paid the price. But discipleship, following Christ, that's a price that you pay. That's your cost. So God's will for your life, if you're saved, is that you would eventually graduate from saved person to saved person disciple of Jesus Christ, okay, or follower of Jesus. So what I want you guys to see, if you're still like, oh, I don't know about that, uh, look at Matthew 28. So you, can, you guys can stay in Matthew 8. All the verses will be on your screen, but um, you want to keep your thumb in Matthew 8. So <clears throat> in Matthew 28, 18, this is what we call the Great Commission. This is the big deal. I mean, this is, this is the whole thing. So when Christ rises from the dead and he's talking to his disciples, This is what he follows up with them. So, Matthew 28. Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and on earth. So, huge. I've just risen from the dead. I'm God. Obviously, now it's clear. Well, now that I have all authority in heaven and on earth, here is what I want you to do. Go, ye therefore, and teach all nations, comma. So, that's one part. 
and then baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even until the end of the world. Amen. In the Great Commission, we have this breakdown of get them saved, and then after they're saved, get them established in obedience unto God. So go ye therefore and teach all nations. Well, what are you teaching them as you go? Whether that's going out into, you know, you're going out of your house into Kalamazoo, or whether that's going out of Kalamazoo to Texas, or out of Kalamazoo to Zimbabwe. Like, wherever the going is, what are you teaching them? Well, you're teaching them, hey, there's one God, his name is Jesus Christ. Oh, you're a sinner, by the way, and you're really terrible. You, you really deserve hell, and Jesus Christ died for your sins. He rose from the dead on the third day. He's God. You should get saved. That's, that's what you're teaching them, and then they get saved, and then a transition occurs, and then you baptize them. That's a step of obedience that follows salvation. You have now crossed the threshold from believer to starting and trending towards disciple. You're starting to trend towards, I'll obey the Lord with my life. Baptisms, we teach it like it's the first step that you do. If you're not going to get baptized, you're basically saying from the jump, I'm not going to obey God. I just want to be saved and be done. I want nothing else to do with this. Well, after baptism, then you teach them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. That is the life of a disciple. Where as you learn all things that Jesus Christ has commanded in his word, you then apply it to your life and you grow. That's our model. This is what Jesus has given us to do. This is the thing that he said with all the authority in heaven and earth. Go and get this done. If a church isn't doing this, then they're not doing what Jesus was doing or what Jesus was pushing after he rose from the dead. This is what we're supposed to be doing and why we do what we do. So the first step is teach them the gospel. The second step is get them established in obedience. If you're saved currently and you're still drawing breath on the planet, well, this is the reason that you're left here. Like, you ever wonder... Why didn't you just get saved and then get teleported to heaven? God was trying to reconcile you to himself. Well, he did that. He saved you. You're born again and you're in Christ and you're reconciled. Why not just beam you out of here and be done? Well, the logical answer is that, well, there's something for you left to do. And the point of you being down here is that you would be engaged in fulfilling the Great Commission, which is accomplished by evangelism and discipleship. That you would give your life to try to reach lost people. And if you reach them, or if you're involved in your local church, you then build up young believers in the faith, and you would get them established in God's Word. And you teach them a pattern of obedience. That's what you're here to do. And if you aren't involved in that, then you're just not doing the thing that God left you here to do, which would then beg the question, why even keep you down here? So <clears throat> that's the calling. That's what a disciple does. A disciple is somebody who is seriously established in the Great Commission. Well, there's some costs that come with that. There's costs to being a disciple. We would be wise to consider those costs before we sign our name on the dotted line. And then, you know, a year in after you're like, oh man, this is just too much. Then backing out. You don't want to be that guy. So Mark 8:34, When he had called the people unto him with his disciples also, he said unto them, Whosoever will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it. But whosoever shall lose his life for my sake and the gospels, the same shall save it. So, again, another amazing marketing thing. How many people are running to that? Yes, Lord, sign me up for the cross, please. 
None. That's, this is not the tagline for get as many people as you can. This is the tagline for find out who's actually serious and who's actually going to do this. So to follow Jesus Christ, it comes to the cost of your life. As Pastor mentioned this morning, the cross is not a necklace and it's not, you know, a monument or whatever. It's not a logo for being a Christian. Like, the cross is an instrument of death. It was always an instrument of death until we made it into what we wanted it to be, something more stomachable. So to bear the cross, it's not that you go and kill yourself. That's ridiculous. To bear the cross is to kill your desires and plans, and you ultimately exchange those for Christ. So the reason I do this big, long intro is because this is what Jesus is lining out in Matthew 8. And our text will help us break down what dying to yourself, bearing the cross, uh, being a disciple of Jesus, here's what that costs. Matthew 8. So go back to verse 19 of our text, and we'll break this down. Jesus covers four things in here uh, that are, you could call them costs. Things that if you're going to be a disciple of Jesus, these, this is what it's going to cost you to do that. So verse 19, a certain scribe came and said unto him, Master, I will follow thee whithersoever thou goest. And Jesus saith unto him, The foxes have holes, and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. So what's on the line here? What, what is the cost of following Jesus Christ that is being displayed in this text? Well, it could just be your housing situation. You ever think about that? What is a home? If I have a home, well, that's, that's, my, that's my castle. That's my shelter. That's where I go, and that's where I feel secure. My home is my comfort. Well, if you look at the ministry of Christ, I mean, sometimes he's in a house. Sometimes he's not. Sometimes he's here. Sometimes he's there. He's always on the move. If you look at the ministry of Paul, Paul's over here, and Paul's over there, and Paul's uh, enjoying luxury, and Paul is not enjoying luxury. In one point, Paul is, you know, Paul is spending 24-hour period uh, in the water because he's trying to not drown. And then in another period, you know, he's in Lydia's house, who is a seller of purple goods. So probably had a nice place. If you're going to serve Jesus Christ, your housing could be on the line your security, your comfort. If it costs you, whatever your life laid out, however your life laid out, um, this isn't necessarily saying you have to sell your house and move to Nicaragua. This isn't what we're talking about. But would you sell your house where you currently live and everything that you built and established if it meant that you had the opportunity to serve the Lord in a greater capacity uh, an hour away. Like, would that be would that be a deal breaker for you? You're like, mm, Lord, no. That's my that's where I draw the line. My house is the last. That's the last thing. Would you be accepting of maybe some uncertainty? Where you're like, okay, we moved over here and we're serving the Lord over here and we're here for now, but you know, what's next year look like? I don't know. Maybe, I don't know. You're going to be here next year? I, I don't know. We've got a temporary place because this is where the Lord has us and this is what we're doing. Like, is that, is that level of insecurity a deal breaker for you? Because something like that might just be on the line to serve Christ. Philippians 4.11. Paul says, Not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. I know both how to be abased and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things, I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. And you guys know the, you know the next verse. Well, wherever Paul was, Paul was able to find contentment in the fact that he was serving Jesus Christ with Jesus Christ. And whether he was eating steak 
or whether he was eating ramen. Paul is just so excited about the fact that he gets to serve Christ. And whether he's in an apartment or whether he's in a nice permanent place on a really good foundation, whatever. Poverty, luxury, doesn't matter. Security, insecurity, doesn't matter. Abound, suffer, need. Do I get to serve Christ, yes or no? Okay, yes, then I don't care. That's the heart of a disciple. Even their house, they hold out like, Take it, don't take it, Lord, it doesn't matter. I'm going to serve you regardless. Now, you may not have to move, and you may not even have to sell. You stay where you are. But you know that when you're a disciple, one of the marks of you're trying to lead lost people to Christ, or you're trying to uh, interact with some young saved people, and you're trying to get them established, or new people, well, that means that... uh, that's going to cost you maybe the comfort in your house and the fact that nobody's ever there. Like, I like my house. It's my house. Nobody comes over. Like, well, that, that's, that's, that's done. If you're going to serve Christ, you're going to have people at your house. Like, you might have people at your house at 9 p.m. Like, is that, is, is that a deal breaker for you? If you're going to make yourself available at any time, to pour into somebody, then even your your bubble is on the line. Your house needs to be open and available if you're going to serve Christ. That's actually one mark of a pastor. That's a qualification for a pastor. You say, well, I'm not a pastor. Well, it doesn't matter. It's in the Word of God. You're supposed to be hospitable. So next thing, Matthew 8, 21. And another of his disciples said unto him, Lord, suffer me first to go and bury my father. But Jesus said unto him, follow me and let the dead bury their dead. So the next thing that's on the line for if if you're going to be a disciple, well, that's going to cost you your mindset. That's going to cost your motivation. The guy, when he came to Christ, he's got something fundamentally wrong with his approach. So he says, Lord... So, Lord on one hand, and then right after he says that, suffer me first. Well, Lord and me first, that those things are fundamentally opposed to one another. So, and just even the word suffer. So, we know the Lord is long-suffering, and if you're suffering something, uh, you don't like it but you're going to put up with it. So basically what he's telling him is, Lord, uh, uh, just deal with, quickly, just deal with me being first for a while. Well, that mentality, you wonder why Jesus responds the way that he does to him? Uh, That mentality and being a disciple, a follower of Christ, that, that doesn't line up. Those don't work. So, Lord, I'm going to do me, and you're just going to have to put up with it. I mean, nobody would have the audacity to say that. That's not going to be part of their, now I lay me down to sleep at night. Like, it's not going to be, or you're not going to wake up, Lord, um, I'm going to do me today, and uh, you're just going to have to eat that. Nobody's going to say that. But we live that way with our life all the time. When the Word of God is preached, and it's saying, hey, this is what you ought to do. This is what the Lord says. And you say, I'm going to do this instead because I want to do this instead. What you're, what you're communicating with your life is, well, Lord, uh, me first. So I know you saved me and everything, but me first. So the mentality here is I'm, my life is about me and I will find areas where I can squeeze Jesus in. So, you know, he can... He can have like the 10% over here, but the other 90, that's, that's mine. Well, the mentality of a disciple is, well, my life is Christ's. And then when I find opportunity, I'll squeeze me in. I'll squeeze me in on the back end. 
because I put Christ first. And whatever Christ wants or whatever he wants to do, whatever his will is for my life, that's what I do. And then when I can find the time, I'll do what I want to do uh, within the liberty that God has afforded me. So 2 Corinthians 5.14 <clears throat> It says, for the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge, that if one died for all, then we're all dead. And that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. So just by the fact that you're saved, that actually means, like, the fact that, you've, that Christ has died for you and you've accepted that, what God is therefore then expecting of you is that since he died for you, you would then, by extension, live for him. That is the right mentality. That you would cease living for yourself and putting yourself first, and me first, Lord, suffer that, and then your mindset would shift to, no, Lord, you first, because you saved me. So what wouldst thou have me to do? That is the difference in mentality between a saved person and a disciple. It's different. Third thing, Matthew 8, 21 again. <clears throat> so he tells him, follow me. Let the dead bury their dead. Such a weird phrase just in and of itself. And again, super mean. Like Jesus is a meanie. Well, what we find here is a guy, he's placing huge importance on something that we would we would place huge importance on that. Man, my dad died. Like, if my dad died, I'm going to be wrecked for a little while. I'm going to want to do the whole thing. Well, Jesus tells this guy, leave it. Why would he do that? Why, why would he say something so mean to this guy? Well, clearly he's trying to teach him a lesson. We are incredibly good at placing really high importance on physical things. There's stuff in your life and stuff in my life where you're like, man, this is so important. I have to get it done. This thing means so much to me. But then if Jesus were to look at it from his perspective, he'd be like, that, that thing doesn't matter at all. That thing that you're so interested in, it, it doesn't have as much importance as you're putting on it. So what we find is a guy putting a ton of importance on a physical thing happening in his life. And Jesus is saying, bury your father or follow God while he's on earth. Like, you only have, at this time, he would have had, what, less than a year maybe to get that done? Like, the scales tip on that. So what about your life? A disciple is able to recognize with different eyeballs, man, this physical thing, yeah, it's important. And it, it's, it matters. But man, this spiritual thing that I only can do right now, well, that's just more important. So I guess I'll just leave that physical thing off. That's what Jesus is trying to get this guy to see. Now look at the wording. Let the dead bury their dead. Well, how can a dead person bury a dead person? They're both dead. They can't do anything. So what's he talking about? Unsaved, lost people. You are dead in your sins and transgressions. Christ is saying, man, let, let the lost people who are dead, who only understand and value physical things, man, let, let, let them deal with that physical thing that's so important. You, since you have the ability to invest your life in spiritual things, you do the spiritual thing and you leave the physical thing to them. Crazy, crazy wording. As a born-again person, you're the only people on the planet that have the ability to fulfill the Great Commission. You're the only people on the planet 
that can actually decide, based on the knowledge that I have, I'm going to keep these words and have it actually matter. You're the only people on the planet that can do that. And until you die or the rapture, once that point happens, you'll never be able to do it again. Obedience can only be done now. Investment in spiritual things can only be done now. So whatever that looks like for your life, the Lord's push for you is, man, you're so invested in these physical things. Man, as much as you can, leave those things to the lost and invest yourself in the spiritual things. So Colossians 3, 1 and 2, If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affections on th- or affection on things above, not on things on the earth. Set your affection on things above. Or wait. Sorry, I read my note. So set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. Paul is communicating the same thing that Jesus Christ was communicating to this guy. It's just in way better words and it's so much easier to swallow. You should, if you are a disciple, you should have a pattern in your life of saying, I could do that thing, but I am instead going to choose this other thing instead because it's spiritual and it matters and has eternal importance. So I'm going to invest myself in that instead as much as is in me. So if you would choose to turn away from certain things and instead turn to keeping the Lord's commandments and fulfilling these spiritual agendas, what you'd find is that it's so much more important to you then and just so much better than golf or your career or your pets or politics or, I mean, you name it. What what is so important? what you'll find is that doing the will of the Lord is so much more fulfilling and better. I had plans last night, right? I had stuff that I was going to do that I had been wanting to do all day. And I'm like, man, once I wrap up my work and whatever, then I can finally do it. Well, then it hits me. I'm like, oh, man, Uh, Eli just got back. I haven't seen Eli in like forever. He's gone in Florida. I should see how Eli's doing. He should come over. And I spent three hours talking to Eli, and it was so much better than what I would have done. And, oh my gosh, I'm such a martyr, whatever. Well, (laughs) discipling Eli is my responsibility, and I find great joy in it, more than the physical thing that I was going to do. And that pattern proves itself over and over and over. Every time I do it, I'm like, man, why didn't I just start with that? Because it's just better. Now if we look over at Luke 9. So we're not going to read the whole entire passage. Uh, You guys will probably have to skip through, but uh, verses 57 uh, through 60 are literally the same account that we just read in Matthew. But Luke gives us one more. Uh, one more guy comes up to Christ. And again, Christ is super gentle and really nice to him. So 61. And another also said, Lord, I will follow thee, but let me first go bid them farewell, which are at home at my house. I mean, couldn't be a simpler request. And Christ says, No man, having put his hand to the plow and looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. All right, I guess we're all done. Like, what is he, what's he communicating? Because he's telling this guy, don't even go home. You don't have time to go home because we got stuff to do. Well, he's communicating to him and trying to get him to see, man, serving me and following me, well, that's actually more important than even your family. And then the whole church leaves because that, that's the line. 
House, eh, I mean, whatever. You can just buy another one, except you can't right now, or you'll be in debt for the rest of your life. Um, house, man, I mean, myself, like, people learn once they have kids that they just don't matter anymore. Like, I think that's something that people could get over. My hobbies, I mean, where? But family, that's the line. If it's going to cost me that, in any way, I'm out. Sorry, Lord. Luke 14, 26. If any man come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters, yea, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. Heavy stuff. Now, does this actually mean go hate your family? You know, go and tell your wife, all right, the Lord told me I should hate you, so we're done. Well, that would contradict other scriptures. So we know that it can't be that. So what do you do with these types of contradictions? Well, you just use your brain because it's, not a, it's really not that difficult. Your service to the Lord, well, it might just push your family to think, man, Dad hates me. I never see Dad. I don't see Dad as much as I used to. He must hate me. Or man, I, you know, your family, your or your extended family, or whatever, you can say, man, you, you used to come over, you used to come over every Monday night. Why don't you come over anymore? We never see you. And then your response back would be, man, I, sorry, I, I'm running a Bible study that night. Like, I'm sorry that you feel like I'm neglecting you, but I am putting my relationship and my service for Christ before you. I'm sorry if that hurts your feelings. You know, you could, you could go home on the weekend to see your family. Well, but then what that would mean is that you'd have to cancel the Bible study that you do on Saturday morning. So, well, then you just don't, you just don't go home and you just wait until Christmas or Easter or whatever, because the work of the Lord is more important than even your physical family. We had uh, some missionaries back at our old church that uh, just over the course of the years, as they were growing in the Lord, they just decided they, that the Lord was, was calling them to Ireland. And they planted a church there, and they're killing it right now, and it, everything is going great. Well, one of the families, we, they sent like four families, and the one family had like three or four kids. And the one kid was in his, you know, moody teenage years. So he finds out that dad is moving them to Ireland. So his response then is, dad, why do you hate me? And his response back was, son, I, I don't hate you. Like, I'm sorry that, you know, you're going to lose your friend at school and whatever. But, but I just love Christ more. I mean, have you ever thought or even said something like that to somebody else? Has your service for Christ and your obedience to the Lord, has that ever made someone in your life think, man, do they, why do they hate me? Why are they acting this way towards me? Or is it more like, well, you know, my wife or my girlfriend, well, she doesn't want to come to church, so I guess we just won't. Well, then you've flipped and you put the person before Christ and now you're just totally out of alignment. That's usually what saved people do. They find some reason to put their family before Christ. And I can only imagine, you know, being raised Muslim or Hindu or whatever, and then getting saved and then having to go through family member after family member after family member who says, I'm done with you. Or vice versa. What if you had to cut a family member off? 
for different various reasons because of your commitment to Christ. This is, these, are, these are waters that only disciples wade through because the, the rest of the saved people just don't. This is the tap out point. So he, he continues on <clears throat> in Luke 14, and he just, if that wasn't all, if this whole thing wasn't enough, if you haven't gotten yet that, man, being a disciple comes at a cost, he wraps it up in verse 33. He says, So likewise, whosoever he be of you, that forsaketh not all that he hath, he cannot be my disciple. All right. I guess that weeds out 99%. All that I have, are you kidding me? Well, what you find is that that's usually not how it starts. You start with the heart of, yes, Lord. It's, it's all on the altar. My life is a living sacrifice for you, uh, so I'm just going to take my family and my job and my whatever, and I'm just going to leave it all out here my time and my hobbies, and I'm just going to start putting you first. And whatever I end up with at the end, I am content with that. What you find is that it, it just starts to take more and more and more of your life as you go. And as you go, you just don't even notice that this stuff is going. Like, that's at least been, that's at least been my experience. I certainly never thought I'd be doing this. Uh, I just got saved one time, and then it just kind of went from there. <laughs> like, I didn't set out to do this. But along the way, I just said, sure. That's what you want, I'll do it. And what I found is that it just started to just take more and more stuff, and I just said, sure, fine. And I wouldn't trade any of it for anything. So to be a disciple... Every aspect of your life, it just needs to be up for grabs. That's what being a disciple is. And that's what separates a disciple from just a normal saved person. So I've told you guys before, uh, I'm a super big nerd. Uh, please show my next picture. Yes. <laughs> you don't even know how happy this makes me. So if any of you know, this is Smeagol from Lord of the Rings. So Smeagol is the perfect picture of the person who says, I have everything that I need. So Smeagol, Smeagol is you, right? And then the ring, his precious, well, that, that's, that's your life. That's you first that he's holding. And you're saying, my life is my life. And I will never lose it because my life is my precious. And I'm not giving up any thing. And there's certain parts of my life that I am not going to give them up. Well, Smeagol was real happy for a good while. Show my next picture. <clears throat> this is Smeagol in the end. I don't know how well you can see that from where you are, but... <clears throat> Smeagol started as just a normal dude. But then, over the course of the years, his precious thing that he loved so much, what actually began to corrupt him and destroy his heart from the inside to the point where he couldn't have gotten rid of the ring if he wanted to. In the end, it ends up costing him his life, but... I use this dumb analogy just to illustrate the picture. Christ says, man, if you save your life, you'll lose it. And, or but, if you lose your life for the sake of Christ and for the sake of the gospel, to be a disciple, you'll save it. It works out better for you in the end if you just let go of the thing. Because eventually there comes a point where you held on to it for too long that now you can't get rid of it. So lose your life while you can before 
you've just jacked everything up, and now it's too late. So to wrap this thing up, <clears throat> Philippians 3, here's what Paul has to say about the whole deal. <clears throat> it says, What things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ. <laughs> this Paul was an incomparable disciple of Christ. He says, if it, if it gained me, I just, in comparison to gaining Christ, I just dumped the stuff. And doubtless, not even a thought in my mind, did I, did I, did I count it as anything of gain to myself. I, I look back at it now that I lost it, and I say, oh, it's, it's just garbage in comparison. I count it but don't. Because the thing that you lose, you are gaining, or you are, you're comparing it to gaining the knowledge of Christ and gaining serving Christ and actually being his disciple and fulfilling with your life the thing that you were saved for. You compare that to holding on to your temporal life that you so enjoy. And it's, it, it's just, it's garbage compared to great riches. Paul continues in Philippians 3.13. <clears throat> says, Brethren, count not myself to be apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. So all those things that he left behind, and you guys know Paul's history, Paul left behind more than you would ever even consider leaving behind. And I just don't think that's arguable. He left it all behind, and he says, man, I, I don't even remember it. I just, in comparison to Christ, I just forget all those things. They don't even matter. Because I have devoted my life to pressing toward the mark, because I have a high calling on my life to reach out to Christ with the time that I have on this planet. I'm going to serve Christ as my king so that when he gets here, well, then I get to serve him and I get to be established in his kingdom. Paul wasn't trading that life for this life. And he's not earning his salvation, none of that nonsense. But as Pastor addressed this morning, he's striving to earn a position in the kingdom of God when Jesus Christ shows up. Because once that day comes, there's not anything that you'd rather do. And if you poured your life into this one, you won't be able to. And it will be weeping and tears not being wiped away for a thousand years. The disciple just has it better. They have it better now. They have it better in the end. There is no logical reason to just stay an unchanged, saved person for your whole life. It makes no sense. Trace, if you don't mind, we'll wrap this up. <clears throat> so I have one final verse for us. <clears throat> I just want to go back to that Luke 9 verse, 62. That big mean thing that Christ said. <clears throat> There's no man having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. What was he asking? He's decided, Lord, I will serve you. And I will follow. He already said that he would. So I'm, I'm going to follow you. But then he remembered, oh man, I got, I got some stuff back there that I got to take care of. So I have to turn back to go say goodbye. And then I have to come back to Christ. If you're deciding... I want to serve the Lord, and I want to be a disciple. I don't even know what that means, really, but I want to. Well, don't let the things 
Don't let the things that are going to be behind you, that you have to leave behind, don't let them deter you from going forward. Because once you turn back, it just seems like it's one thing after another, and then you end up never doing it. Whatever you think you might lose, just lose it and choose to follow Christ. Do what you've set your mind to do. So with that, stand with me and we'll close. Every head bowed, every eye closed. I just want to give you guys an opportunity to, man, if you feel like I need to go to the altar, I, I, I I have a life that is not in alignment with Christ. If I were to compare this and all these costs to what I'm paying, somewhere in my life I've told the Lord, no, I'm not paying that. That's that's too much of a cost. I just want to stay here and be comfy. And I just want to be a believer. I don't want to be a disciple. If that's something that you're telling the Lord right now, I would encourage you to let go of that thing and start making the steps in your life to get that right. Lord, I thank you for your word. And I thank you, Lord, that you would call losers and bum sinners like us to your service. God, I thank you that you didn't just save us just to save us. Lord, you've reconciled us to yourself and uh, Lord, you've given us newness of life and, and, and power through the Holy Ghost to do the things that you've called us to do. God, what a waste it would be to never do them. Father, I pray that uh, in all of our different various means and in all the different ways, God, that this could reach us today. God, I I just pray that we would pay the cost to follow you and get serious about it, Lord. Help us. Lord, by your grace, we can do this, and we can bring you great glory before you come back. And we can be found of you working when you get here. Lord, we thank you for this day. Thank you for your word. pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. All right, you guys are dismissed. Have a great